to all of those that are starting to to gather together here now thanks very much for for coming over thanks very much for registering and thanks very much for attending this webinar brought by csp group and uh the multi the residency multi agency and swiss insurance partners the webinar will start in approximately two or three minutes so we allow uh the rest of attendees we give them a, a chance to uh, catch up with, uh, with the rest of you. So in the meantime, if you would like to grab, I don't know, a cup of coffee, water, whatever it is, and uh, make yourself comfortable, we have a very interesting webinar with uh, Mr. Charles Mitzi and Robert and Kevin from, uh, from Swiss Insurance Partners and uh, Renaissance Mold Agency. How are you doing, Charles? How is everything, Rob? I think you are muted, sorry. Everything's fine. Thanks, Andres. Hope all's going well. well. All is fine from our end as well. Brilliant. Excellent. By the way, um, Rob and, and, and Kevin, what about are you, are you based right now? Are you based in Switzerland, right? Yes, we are based in Switzerland, in Zurich. Uh, we have offices also in, in Liechtenstein. Um, or from time to time, we are uh, as well on Malta. And surprisingly, we heard today that it was raining uh, in Malta in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> which is a very special day, I assume. <laughs> Yes, it's quite a strange day. <laughs> uh, started with some showers this morning, but now weather is better, much better. It, it, it is the, the good thing of, of mold. I mean, you have showers from time to time, but then it's just basically, they go quite, quite fast at the, at the same time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very cold, almost like Switzerland, you know, 13, 15 degrees, it, is, it goes in those lines. <laughs> <laughs> 13, 15, it's like summer here in Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't get much better now. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, excellent. So, so again, once again, to, uh, to Charles, to Rob, and to Kevin, thanks very much for, for being here, for, for participating in this webinar. It is, uh, it is our pleasure to, uh, to have you here. And uh, just as a brief agenda, once the, the rest of participants are, are, are joining us, um, we're going to start after, um, after this with a, with a very short poll to understand from, from where you're from, from where you are based and from where the audience it is, uh, it is watching us. Then we're going to make a short introduction to CSP Group and uh, to our speakers. And finally, after an introduction to uh, Malta, we're going to pass the ground to uh, Mr. Chad Milsi, which is going to start with his presentation about the new Malta residence, uh, permanent residence program. And then after, uh, our colleagues from Swiss Insurance Partners are going to make their presentation and we're going to end up with a Q&A session uh, at the end. So in terms of questions, basically, if any of you in the audience, they have any questions to ask at any point in time, please make sure that you uh, ask that on the Q&A uh, section that you have on the, on the webinar. Um, that, um, that question is going to be answered towards the end. So don't worry if uh, we take a little bit longer, it is going to be answered towards the end where we're going to be discussing that uh, into detail. So thanks very much. In uh, 16.05, we're going to formally start the, uh, the webinar. So welcome all. And um, as I said before, we're going to start with a short poll. Let me launch the poll right now. Basically a few seconds, if you wouldn't mind uh, vote from where you are watching us. Um, if you are in Europe, if you are in Asia, Africa, US or Canada, Russia, or Latin. Not sure if you're going to have someone from Latin America, where, where I am currently from. Based, uh, we've been born in Argentina and then made a few, a few turns around. Okay, so we have 85% of the people voted and um, most of them, they are from Europe, including the UK. Thanks, Mark. It is our pleasure, basically, for you to, to be here. Then, uh, first, Europe, including the UK, Asia, and Africa, uh, people watching us. So, so, thanks very much for participating. Now, um, a little bit of, uh, basically, our company, CSP Group. Um, CSP Group is a family-owned business, and it's established in 1987. The group counts with traditional heritage in Malta, providing a holistic approach to private and corporate client services. Thanks to this, a true entrepreneurial spirit and continuous growth efforts, the group has attracted global brands like Malta Sotheby's International Realty for luxury and commercial real estate. 
reaches for serviced offices and co-working spaces. And currently we have three business centers on the island. And finally, Vacancy Center, CSB Group Recruitment Arm, which allowed us or what allow us to act like uh, with a true one-stop shop concept and mindset since inception. Our CSB, CSB Group founder, Mr. Tony Samit, it is the current chairman, and the group is headed by Mr. Michael J. Summit as a group CEO, Mr. Roger Studland Jr. as director and a gaming specialist, and Mr. Jenko Cardona as operations and finance director. In terms of our service, we service private clients in terms of investment migration, citizenship and residence planning, tax planning, real estate, and wealth structuring, corporate services in terms of company formation, trustee, financial services, tax and accounting, as well as we're very strong uh, in legal with our legal team. We offer services in terms of intellectual property and regulated industries as well on iGaming, financial services, and blockchain and fintech. Now I would like to present, formally present you with uh, our speakers. Myself, basically, I am Andre Gutierrez. I am the moderator of this webinar and I'm investment migration advisor at CSP Group and Malta Solaris International Real. I'm formerly a lawyer in two different jurisdictions, have worked in four different jurisdictions and have started in investment migration almost 10 years ago in government advisories. And I'm a member of the Investment Migration Council. Then, and for the important bit, which is why you are here, uh, Mr. Charles Mitzi, it is the CEO of the Malta Residency Agency. And uh, Mr. Mitzi began his career in the banking sector. In October, 2014, he became the executive director of media and marketing of the Malta Presidency for the European Council. Mr. Mitzi today is going to be speaking about the Malta Permanent Residence Program and how basically successfully, successfully apply for it. Finally, Robert Masicheski, it is our speaker and it is the CEO of Swiss Insurance Partner. They are the creators of the SIP Medical Family Office, which are in our the global leaders and provider international health insurance and health management solutions to affluent global citizens in over 65 countries for almost 25 years. Finally, our agenda, after a short introduction to Malta, Mr. Mitzi will speak about the Malta Permanent Residence Program, after which Rob and Kevin were going to be speaking about better health protection for global citizens in their novel approach. And finally, we're going to end up with a Q&A session. So basically, to, um, to get ourselves basically where, where we are, what is Malta and what Malta has to offer at the end of the day. Malta, it is what we would consider actually a safe harbor. And why, why it is a safe harbor? Basically, because it has first class healthcare, for example. Uh, back in last year, it was considered by uh, the World Health Organization as less impacted by COVID. Nowadays, it is a country that one of the first, if not the first country that has reached uh, herd immunity in terms of COVID-19, it has um, done very, very, very well. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, being in an island with a small population makes disease control easier. You can test the greater share of your population faster and you're insulated from the rest of the world at the end of the day. There is an easier border control and the health uh, carrying Malta, it is nothing but outstanding. Finally, basically, also uh, Malta has a very strong and a stable economy. Um, basically, Malta has a very low debt, uh, debt ratio and very strong and resilient economy as we have seen over the years and we are seeing now. It is strategically located, basically uh, from North Africa, Europe and the Middle East, four hours and a half from Moscow, three hours from London, Dubai, it is seven hours. And finally, um, applicants can also, or residents and citizens can also access to world-class education, a very strong and pro-business legal framework and free education for children and university for multi-citizens. So a little bit of country overview, which I'm going to see next. Malta has a population of approximately almost half a million um, inhabitants, 480 approximately, member of the Schengen area, European Union, Commonwealth of Nations, strategically located as we've seen, and a very open um, and welcoming uh, population, basically, where English and Maltese are um, official languages, but also Italian is spoken. Finally, and in terms of growth, uh, before we, we pass the, the ground to Mr. Charles, to Charles Mitzi, uh, some data comparison, basically, in the forecast for uh, Malta in 2022, because after COVID-19, we have all the financials um, difficulties that, that this has provoked. So Malta has, has had a very strong 
and stable growth from 2017, 6.7, um, 6.85% up to 2019, 2019, sorry. And in 2020, obviously, like all um, jurisdictions and countries, has shrinked around the 9%, with a strong recovery forecasted for 2021 and 2020, 2022. Just to give you a little bit of ballpark, um, Basically, the UK in 2020 had a minus 10.3%, and in 2020, 2021, it is forecasted to grow 3.3%. It's still less than, than Malta. Greece, it is forecasted to grow uh, around 3.5%, for example. So having said that, thanks very much for your attention. I'm going to pass the ground now to, to Charles. So Charles, once again, thank you very much for being with us and uh, for us to have, you, to have the opportunity to listen to you speaking about the Malta Residence Program. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andres. Um, I'm going to share the presentation which we prepared um, for this event. Um, just can you confirm that the, the presentation is seen? Okay. So yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Charles Mitzi, CEO of Residency Malta Agency. Um, today, as has been said, I'm going to uh, speak a bit about our new program, which has been launched in uh, March of this year, um, the Malta Permanent Residence Program. The Malta, residence, the Malta Permanent Residence Program obviously builds on the success of the MRVP, um, the Residence by Investment Program, which has been, which had been launched way back in 2016. Um, uh, and obviously it was very well received uh, by, by the applicants uh, in, in general. Um, earlier this year, um, we launched a new program. Um, and in addition to that, we have also uh, conducted a restructuring and we have launched a new agency as well, which is the Residency Malta Agency, previously known as the Malta Residency Visa agency. Uh, so the remit uh, of our agency is, is to uh, manage the country's residency by investment program as regulated by legal notice one to four of uh, 2021. Um, as many of you may know, the Malta Permanent Residence Program is open to third country nationals. Each application can carry up to four generations um, and each application uh, which is submitted to us uh, undergoes uh, stringent due diligence process in order to make sure that only the fit and proper individuals and families make it to our, our program. Every beneficiary will eventually be entitled to a permanent residency in Malta. Um, basically, they can keep uh, the right to reside in Malta permanently for as long as obviously they meet the requirements of the said uh, program. Each beneficiary will also be entitled to visa-free travel across the Schengen area um, for 90 days every 180 days. So basically they can travel within the Schengen area for three months every, every six months. Applicants have two options to choose from. Um, basically they can either decide to purchase a property or lease a property. As, as is shown in the, this particular slide, uh, you can see that there are different thresholds. Uh, basically, there is a threshold for properties purchased or leased in the south, uh, the Gozo, our sister island, and there is another threshold for the rest of Malta. Um, there are sort of different thresholds simply because of the, to reflect uh, the, mar the current market prices. Properties have to be held for a minimum of five years, following which uh, applicants or beneficiaries at that time, because obviously they would have uh, been approved from our side and the certificate would be issued, uh, they would then need to provide us with their residential uh, address uh, so they can decide to lease uh, a property um, according to the thresholds shown on the screen, but then eventually decide to buy a property at a later stage or else lease a different, different property. When it comes to fees and contributions, uh, under the new program, these have been changed a bit. Uh, the contributions have increased from 30,000 euros 
under the previous program up to 68,000 if they decide to purchase a property or 98,000 euros if they decide to lease a property. The contribution will eventually um, uh, be passed on to the uh, government coffers and then eventually invested again in the local economy. There are also um, fees for additional dependents, parents, grandparents, and spouses, children. So uh, there are different uh, fees for the dependents that can be added with each application. A new uh, addition that we've made under the new program is a donation to uh, registered voluntary organizations. Um, basically, each uh, approved applicant would need to make a 2,000 euro donation to a local NGO uh, in order to strengthen the link with the local community. When it comes to the administration of our program, uh, all applications have to be submitted through a licensed agent. So applicants cannot apply directly to us, through us, um, however, they have to go through a licensed agent uh, who will guide them on the process, uh, eventually helps them to fill in a proper application, which is eventually submitted to us, and then we will uh, liaise with the agent uh, in order during the application processing and even after that when it comes to compliance stage. Each application uh, will take between four to six months to process. Obviously, this depends on the quality of the application, whether we have full uh, information in hand, full documentation in hand. So the better the quality of the application, the faster we will uh, process that particular uh, application. Over the last uh, few months, we have invested a lot um, in our efficiency. We have brought down the processing time significantly. In fact, at this point in time, we are processing applications uh, with an average rate of around uh, three months. We have invested heavily in our people and in our uh, processes and procedures, and we are uh, investing even further, even on our IT infrastructure. In fact, um, we are implementing a new CRM system, which will help us to automate a certain process, uh, which will eventually make us even more efficient to the benefit, obviously, of the applicant and the agents themselves. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the due diligence process. Um, basically, we adopt a four-tier due diligence process, which is very, very stringent. It starts uh, from the agent. Basically, every agent is required to conduct a KYC on the applicant, uh, which is then sent to us. The idea over here is obviously to filter applications at initial stage. If the agent uh, finds out that the applicant is not uh, worthy of the application, obviously, uh, the application will be stopped at that stage. Um, once the application reaches us, we will uh, kickstart the process by checking the validity of the documents. Uh, we, have, we need to make sure that we have all the information in hand, all the documentation is properly filled, passports or uh, copies of the passports are, uh, are provided in full. If not, obviously, we go back with questions um, and ask the agent to um, update the documentation. We will then proceed with uh, police clearance and police checks uh, against uh, Europol and Interpol databases amongst others. Um, and in the meantime, we'll start um, our due diligence, obviously checking a number of uh, databases. We investigate for sanctioned individuals, companies, affiliations, bank transactions, etc. Um, uh, and also uh, commission background verification reports by international and highly reputable due diligence um, companies. That will also, that will of course give us a, a true, a full picture uh, of the applicant of the family that they are submitting uh, their application to for the residency program. So that from our side, our case officers would be able um, uh, to compile uh, a detailed report about each and every application in hand. That application will be eventually be uh, submitted um, to a board of approvals, an independent board of approvals, um, for a final decision. Um, obviously, 
once uh, the decision is taken, uh, agents and applicants are informed accordingly. Successful applicants um, also are continuously monitored. Um, basically, um, once the application is, is concluded and the certificate is issued, uh, we conduct ongoing monitoring on every application so that we make sure that they uh, are sort of reputable people and are worthy of, uh, of the right to reside in Malta. If we find out um, that there were any irregularities along the way, we'll definitely investigate and definitely we can revoke the approved permit. Um, when it comes to the uh, program attributes, obviously we believe that um, we have a quite a robust program and the fact that we conduct uh, such intense due diligence um, puts our program on high repute among, uh, among agents and, and applicants themselves because obviously if they make it through our program they know that uh, they are people of uh, high standard um, so they should all be eventually proud that they hold uh, a Maltese um, residency card. Um, we believe that now we have um, an even more competitive uh, program. Uh, the changes we have, that we have done uh, makes the program uh, highly competitive. And at the end of the day, we provide value for money for our applicants as well. Um, over here, we uh, included a slide about sort of Malta's attractions, but Andres has, has done um, a good description about Malta, so I will not go into a lot of detail um, on, uh, on this slide. However, I would like to point out on sort of two specific factors, which we believe are key um, for, for applicants um, to decide on, uh, on why they choose they choose Malta. Um, the first is the healthcare system. Um, obviously, we have uh, very strong healthcare. I think we have done very 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 well when it comes to COVID. Um, uh, we are highly rated, and uh, this is something that applicants ask us a lot about. Um, obviously, they want the peace of mind that they when relocate to Malta and bring their families over here, they want to make sure that they um, would be benefiting from uh, the very uh, healthcare of a high, high standard. Secondly, is the educational uh, system, the educational institutions. Um, most of, of the families that uh, come over to Malta um, their aim and their intention is to offer a better education to their children. So this is also something um, that we are consistently asked about. Um, they check a lot about uh, our educational institutions. We have uh, very good schools, both public and, and private schools. Um, and this is something that we are really um, proud of. So these are, I would say, some of the two main points uh, which would eventually uh, make Malta the country of choice when it comes to, to second residency. Um, this, will, this brings me eventually to the conclusion of my, my presentation. Over here, I would like to stress on two particular uh, points. Uh, basically, the first one is the, our focus on, on efficiency. As I said, we have invested highly in, uh, in our operations over the last uh, few months. Um, we made it our top priority and we are investing even more now with the introduction of new IT system. Um, we understand that uh, people expect us to give a fast and quick service. So obviously without, without hampering uh, on the diligence process. So uh, we need uh, we need to make sure that we live to up to our promise of delivering uh, a reply within four to six months. 
Um, and the second point I already mentioned to it is obviously the fact that we need to keep our standards high and the level of integrity of our NGC high, because obviously uh, this is what uh, perhaps differentiates us from, from other jurisdictions. We want to make sure that uh, we only attract uh, the best uh, of talent, the best of, of people to our, to our country. Basically, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to be here. Obviously, we're more than happy um, to answer any questions that you may have during the Q&A session later on during this, uh, this seminar. Brilliant, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Charles, for, for the presentation. Very, very insightful. Uh, and, and it's true, I mean, at the end of the day, Nowadays, in a more investment migration has become more and more complex over the years. And uh, if there's one thing that is certain, and I have seen in the past, basically all the time that, that I have been in investment migration for around seven to 10 years, it is that mold has always strived its best to be at the forefront uh, of, the, of the market, uh, to basically have the highest standards, to have the highest screening tests. Uh, and I have seen uh, all those changes, uh, all those elevating the bar basically, which uh, it is very welcome, it is very important, um, and uh, it is one of the driving forces of the market right now. I mean, compliance and AML, like uh, tax effectiveness, for example, it is uh, nowadays for, from a client perspective. And uh, tied up with that, I mean, you mentioned something which is very important, which is basically the, the health, the status and the health uh, of Malta overall these years and how Malta has been impacted by COVID. And um, I mean, Mold has made a great effort uh, during the whole pandemic. And right now, if not mistaken, we are at, at herd immunity, which yes, it is true. We are a small country, but at the end of the day, that we are small, but that brings a big effort. <laughs> basically, it is, not, it is something that is not easy, basically. So uh, it is something that when, when I am advising clients, it is something that people ask as well. Normally they ask about um, education, they are about, they're asking about health, they are not asking about like three, four, five years ago about, you know, just basically lifestyle and, and visa-free travel. The changes, the, basically the, um, the needs of, uh, of our clients has changed quite a lot. And uh, investment migration is seen actually as an asset class, basically. And that plan B, that policy insurance, which ties up very, very well to our next uh, presentation, which is from Rob and from Kevin, from Swiss Insurance Partners, because at the end of the day, uh, if basically you want to have your best plan B, your best policy insurance, you also want to have the best health insurance possible. So Rob and Kevin, the ground is yours. Hey, Grandris, and also thank you, Charge, for the very um, interesting conversation. Um, as you mentioned, um, investment migration is um, not only a great opportunity, but it's also a lot about protecting your uh, personal freedom. And I think that ties in nicely to our topic, which is uh, protecting your health, and especially protecting your health for global citizens like people who join such programs. And I want to show you a novel approach that we use for our clients uh, that I think is very important and very valuable. So um, I want to start with uh, talking about COVID, and we all know um, COVID has uh, wrecked havoc around the globe, but if there's one thing or one positive thing that can be said um, about COVID is that um, at least it has um, brought health back to our attention. And uh, Charles mentioned uh, Malta is an excellent healthcare system, and you know, only when you get sick you realize that health is the single most important asset in our life. So you can have all the wealth in, your, um, uh, in the world, you can have all all the opportunities, all the network, but if your health is not there and if you're like one of those unfortunate people, um, then nothing uh, care really is important anymore. So it's especially important that we all protect our health and that we plan our health accordingly. And we, I believe we all have a certain mindset and I include myself under that mindset. We all believe now it's, it's not going to affect me. It's not going to affect me. It's not going to affect my family. We will be spared from all of that. But working as an insurance um, consultant and working with uh, hospitals and clinics and doctors on a daily basis, unfortunately, I have to say, um, 
one day it's going to be you or me or someone from our family. And we are all patients and uh, we all have patients in our families. So it's really important that we think about health in a more proactive way. And the question now is, how can we protect ourselves? And also, how can um, you maybe as advisors protect the health of your clients, which are global citizens, which are moving around the globe, and uh, which also spend a lot of time outside of their home countries. And there are two solutions. There's a minimalistic one, and then there's a good one, or that we believe is a good solution. And I want to talk about those two very briefly. So the minimalistic solution that we see, and that's also true for a lot of applicants um, for not only Malta programs, but around the globe, um, <clears throat> often these people, they you know, they want to check the boxes. They want to go for the cheapest possible local health uh, solution. And then they basically hope, okay, if something happens with me, my family, um, then you know, probably either that local health solution will cover it or most, most cases, my national health insurance plan that they keep will cover me in all situations. And uh, I have to say, it's not true. We are seeing this um, very often that you know, people spend more time out of their home country than they should. And then suddenly the insurance company says, well, that's not travel anymore. This won't be covered. And maybe Kevin will go into some more details in the Q&A. And um, we see that with uh, local health uh, solutions, which can be very uh, cheap, um, often things like COVID-19 complications are excluded. Um, for international citizens or international travelers uh, or global citizens, um, free choice of doctors and clinics is very important. I mean, Malta has uh, excellent hospitals for sure, but maybe so you spend some time uh, of the year abroad in another country. So you want to have a free choice of where you go and where you get treatment so that you don't have to uh, you know, return to either Malta or your um, country um, where you were located before. Other things we see is uh, insufficient maternity rehabilitation coverage. And there are some issues to keep in mind, which are very important, which a lot of people um, forget. And um, we've seen a lot of cases where people leave a country, join a residency uh, a program, um, you know, join a local health insurance, and then something happens with their health. They might get sick, they might get, develop a chronic disease, and maybe at some point they want to change location again, or they want to return to their home country. And then they get into lock lock-in situation because with health insurance companies around the globe, um, once you are sick, unfortunately, it's very hard to get in. So even if you leave your country, uh, go to Malta, and then, for example, come back and you want to rejoin your old insurance, most likely if you have developed any existing conditions that will lead to an exclusion, and that can be very complicated um, because then you lose your cover. And one fundamental uh, mistake most people make is that they think, you know, when something happens, I'll have enough time to figure it out. And then and we can tell you, uh, we deal with patients every day, um, when something happens, then is exactly when you don't have time to figure it out and you want to be prepared. So, um, you know, what's the good solution? What's the better solution? Um, we believe there are two parts to it. One is having a good international health insurance. And the second part is having an experienced health advisory at hand. And I will explain to you um, what these two things mean. So first of all, why international health insurance versus local insurance? So, so um, one of the key points is that international health insurance will give you um, worldwide medical and uh, access to medical and um, excellent protection and insurance. So you can basically all around the world uh, freely choose where you want to get treated, uh, which clinic you want to go. And for example, if you might have an issue with your knee, then you might want to go to Austria because you know, they have ski accidents all day long and they have doctors doing nothing else but operating on knees. So they, are, they have the best surgeon in that area. Um, for there are certain treatments only available in certain countries. When we talk about stem cell therapies, Switzerland is one of the few, few countries worldwide that allow these treatments. So you might want or need to go for treatment for Switzerland. And with an international health insurance, that's what covered. Um, so you get access to the best and cutting edge medical treatment around the globe, notwithstanding how good the local system is. Um, of course, you get other amenities like private ward handling, um, multilingual support from the insurance 24-7. And one very important uh, case is also medical assisting, uh, assistance, including evacuation, repatriation. We're actually were just now working on a case um, where we have a client, a patient who had a severe accident abroad, uh, was in a coma with severe trauma, head trauma, body trauma, now urgently needs to go into rehabilitation. So having the, the freedom to be able to say, okay, I want to go to another country and I will be assisted in doing so, which otherwise can be a nightmare from the regulations, from visas, from medical visas and so on, is very, very helpful. 
Um, but there's one thing to keep in mind, and that's um, insurance protects you from financial threats. But even the greatest insurance won't help you finding the right treatments. And uh, we've uh, seen many cases where people, you know, have the best insurance, but they go through odysseys, which are months or even years long. You know, they're trying to find the right doctor. You now they jump from uh, clinic to clinic, even in different countries. They find to write the right specialist to um, address them, and you now nothing helps. They get overtreated. They get the wrong treatments. Um, they get mistreated. It's, it's, it's incredibly stressful um, for yourself, for the family. Um, sometimes, of course, can be life-threatening if we're talking about um, urgent treatments. So um, that, that's to keep in mind, even with great insurance or as a self-payer, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you get access to the right treatments. So there are three additional elements that you need to really protect your health. And these are the following. The first one is you need access to an excellent global medical network. So you need to know um, who are the best specialists around the globe for my specific, uh, specific condition. And if I ever should you know, develop some sort of um, disease, which is not easily treated, um, who can I get in touch with to tell me, this is the doctor you need to go to in this country. And of course, specialists often have long waiting times, weeks, sometimes months. Um, you need someone who can support you in reducing this time from several months to, you know, in our case, we can typically get our clients into uh, top medical practices to specialists within one or two days, which can be very important. Secondly, preventive medicine. There's a lot that can be done nowadays to um, protect and to actively manage your health. But um, those are things that go beyond you know, just going to your twice yearly uh, checkup with your local doctor. Those are things that really are um, state of the art uh, in medicine. Those include genetic testing, pharmacogenetic testing, um, which is very important. And that's an important element to keep in mind. And finally, proper management of your medical records. And I'll talk about these things um, in just a second. So, um, what we have created is the SIP Medical Family Office. And the idea behind our Medical Family Office is that we protect our clients' health um, in the same way a family office um, would protect their wealth or their financials. So we take care from all directions, um, planning, maintaining their health, not only reactive, but also proactive. And I want to show you um, just briefly a few of the things that we do. So this is kind of the service overview, and I'm going to zoom in that you can better read it. Uh, the first element, of course, is international health insurance. So we've been in this business for 25 years. Um, there is a huge complexity to international health insurance. Everyone requires a different solution. You know, someone who might have multiple residencies and is traveling a lot might be in a totally different place and than someone who just travels between two countries in the summer and uh, during the winter time. And so um, we can assist our clients with that. We help them with finding the right insurance and um, helping them with application, negotiating the right prices. And also we take care of a lot of administrative tasks, such as you know, handing all the claims, make sure that they get their money back quickly. Or for example, if they need um, a guarantee of payment for a treatment in a hospital, um, we take all these burdens off their hands. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is what I mentioned, what we call privileged healthcare. Uh, we have a global network of specialists in all medical areas um, that we've been working on, uh, working on and working with for quite some time. So we can tell you exactly who are the doctors that you should go to um, wherever it is in the world. And we can give you access to these doctors very, very quickly. And that's not only important if you uh, want a first opinion, so if you, you know, go to the doctor for the first time. But uh, in many cases, what we see is you know, we have clients from abroad and they said, look, you know, my wife just got a cancer diagnosis. It's a very specific cancer. Can you help us get a second or even third specialist and review the case? Is this the right treatment? Do I need to go somewhere else? Um, is there someone else we could do, some other options? So these, having this, you know, the, the, the safety of mind that you can always fall back to another op uh, opinion is very important. Um, we have a medical advisory panel. So if you approach us and say, look, I have this very complicated condition. Um, my general uh, practitioner was not able to find out what it is. My local hospital didn't find out. So we have a panel of doctors, uh, one of the most advanced and specialized uh, professors uh, that we can present these cases to. And they can say, OK, look, now this is the direction. This is who we can recommend. This is where you should go. Another very important part, medical emergency services. Um, uh, even if the local um, healthcare system, like in Malta, is very good, sometimes there are cases 
um, where that can be better treated in different countries. And actually, we just have a case, um, a client uh, actually from the Ukraine was in a severe car accident, uh, head trauma, uh, body trauma, was in a coma. And um, they said they don't feel he can be treated the right way. So what we are doing right now is um, we are um, we have selected and, and introduced them to a fantastic one of the world's best rehabilitation centers here in Switzerland, and we take care of everything around that for the patient and the family, so um, you know that they can get um, you know can get an intensive care transport from that country to Switzerland, um, that they have an interpreter. Um, that they have someone at hand and on the ground who will uh, assist them remotely. And so uh, these things are very important. Um, and having this access to, to such a privileged healthcare um, network is, is really very important. Um, another thing, medical records management, um, also very critical. You know, um, I'm sure we all know medical records are not the thing that we care uh, the most about, um, as long as we're healthy, relatively healthy. So especially if you're a global citizen, traveling between different countries, maybe moving location every few years, that means you might have your records in country A and B and C and in different languages. And that's fine as long as nothing happens. But as soon as something happens that you need to, to seek treatment, um, then you can lose a lot of time fishing for your records. And um, you, know, you, know, you might have medical records in Russia and some of them in France and some of them in somewhere else. So you know, when you need to seek urgent treatments, then you first need to you know, contact all the doctors. You need to collect the documents. You need to translate them sometimes hundreds of pages. So what we do is for all of our clients, we centrally store um, the, and safely store the records. Uh, we have them translated. Um, we have them summarized. So all of our clients basically has a one, have a one-page summary of their medical history, of the medications they're taking, any previous treatments, pre-existing conditions, genetic risks, uh, family risks. So whenever you as a client go to another doctor or clinic, you can take that one pager or have it electronically presented to the doctor. Within two minutes, they will know, um, you know what's your current status. And if they then need any further records, um, then it's a, no, that happens very briefly and you no, know, usually within the same day. So then you can save a lot of time. And you know, we have cases where you know, people come from foreign countries for cancer treatment in another country. And you know, when we talk about an aggressive type of cancer, for example, um, you don't want to waste two or three or four weeks uh, you know, having your doc documents translated before any substantial treatment can begin. You want to have it happen now and you want to have it happen today. So that's why this is very important. And uh, finally, preventive medicine, um, as I said, very important point, often un, uh, overlooked. It's a lot can be done today, whether it's genetic testing for chronic diseases later in age, whether it's, for example, um, pharmacogenetic testing. That means how do you, how, the, how does your individual body react to medications? And those are incredibly important things to know. So I give you one example, um, one in four people uh, on average have a genetic mutation. So that's a bunch of uh, you listening to this uh, webinar. And if you have that genetic mutation, that will mean that you will not properly react to the most common heart medications. So that means that if you no know, one in four uh, out of you, if you happen to have a heart attack sometime in the future and you just end up in the emergency room and you get treated with one of the most common heart medications, um, they either won't work or can even have adverse events. So you might die because uh, you don't know that you have this uh, specific mutation, which could easily be preventable. If you know what it is, they can just give you another medication, but you have to know it. And if nobody knows, then that can really be critical. So really knowing a lot about your body and, and actively taking care, um, taking programs to manage your health, to avoid um, genetic disadvantages, uh, which might, later might lead to chronic diseases, um, capture uh, chronic diseases as early as possible is very important. And so uh, for our clients, we have some programs which really look deeply into um, these personal medical uh, situations, and then we can better protect them. Um, yeah, to basically to, to sum it up, um, one of the most common questions that we get is, you know, how much does it cost? And to be quite, quite frank with you, no, it's not the cheapest option. If you just want to tick the boxes and just, you know, uh, get the paperwork over with, then neither international health insurance nor medical advisory um, are things that are the lowest cost. But um, 
I believe it's worth it. And international health insurance starts at maybe two, three thousand, four thousand uh, euros per year. Um, medical advisory, for example, our services um, is a membership for one year, which will cover unlimited um, consultations by us. Uh, so for a few hundred uh, euros per month, you can basically make sure that your health is protected as good as it uh, can get. And um, a lot of clients say, okay, well, maybe it's still a lot of money. You know, I have a big family, but what I always tell people is, you know, ask your clients or ask yourself how much did you spend on watches and cars and holidays and toys in the last year and how much did you spend on your and your family's health and no i know i also like nice watches but uh, and no nice watch will protect your health and no nice watch will save you when you really have a health emergency and being protected is one of the most critical things you can do and especially for those here in the room who are working as client advisors um I can really tell you that you know, if you typically know your clients very well, you know their history, you know the family, um, you get to know them over the years quite intensely. And if there's at one point you can help your client uh, with supporting the health or the family member, or maybe save their family member because you can get them to the right doctor very quickly, and there's no better way to, to actually um, bind to your client and there's there's no stronger tie that you can bind to any of your clients because no one will ever forget if you help them with your help so this is not only for you listening but this is also very important for your clients and uh, of course um, Kevin and I will be happy to answer all of your questions afterwards and um, in the quick Q&A of course we'll answer some more questions that is fantastic Rob thanks very much for for the presentation uh, great and very very interesting uh, certainly uh, a novel approach and uh, basically, there are two things that they they caught my one thing that that it caught my eye when when you were during the whole time of the presentation, which is basically how um, for a wealthy client, for a private client, high net worth, super high net worth individual, um, these type of solutions uh, basically match what they are actually doing with investment migration. Because at the end of the day. What you are offering it is not uh, necessarily mainstream. That's why we like it at the end of the day, and that's why we we are very interested in these type of solutions. Um, it is not the tick box exercise, but it is basically um, a long term view. And normally, clients, uh, advisors like us, and clients that they want to do some sort of citizenship and residence planning, that they want to apply for uh, the Maltese Permanent Residence Program, that they want a better education, they would normally would want uh, a better health. And uh, this part of um, global health ties up with a uh, global mobility. At the end of the day, um, I was speaking with your chairman uh, a few weeks ago here in, uh, in Barcelona and uh, was mentioning that at the end of the day, if, um, if, if the hospitals, if the different health insurance uh, companies, they are they are thermometers. So, you know, they Swiss, um, basically strip um, the, the city medical family office acts as this as a thermostat, basically finding the best thing, the the best place to go. And if you don't have basically a residence in uh, in in Europe, for example, uh, it's going to be sometimes very difficult to go and to travel to Switzerland, to Spain, or whatever that that hospital that hospital is. So. So great, great presentation and very, very, very interesting. Thanks, thanks very much indeed. You're welcome. Brilliant, excellent. So basically we have um, a few questions. I'm going to move towards the, um, the Q&A uh, section. Um, we'll start basically from the beginning as we, um, as we discussed and then we'll basically we'll pass on. I have some questions that they have been asked during this webinar and some of them that they have been kindly submitted by some of our, um, our attendees. So starting basically from the beginning, Charles, from your presentation, we have uh, one person that would like to know if real estate, it is the only type of investment that the PRP can offer, and if there are any other instruments. So I think that there is a little bit of confusion with the MRVP. Can you please share some light on that, that topic? Um, yes, real estate is the only uh, investment uh, solution uh, for the time being. Uh, basically, with the changes we've done, we've removed the need for uh, bonds and stocks uh, and instead increased the direct contribution to the government. Excellent. Perfect. So basically, that's, that's, that's clear. There's been that, that move basically from the MRVP with the bonds up to the new PRP with basically the, the, the rental or the property purchase. Thinking about that, the rental and the property purchase, um, a question that, that I get asked quite a few quite a few times 
and uh, just for the audience as well. Let's say that one applicant starts renting a property, basically. And then two or three years down the line, he really likes Malta. He just basically has one child that is bringing into, I don't know, they are from India or they are from Russia. They are bringing into Malta, starts education, and they want to move to another house, a bigger house perhaps they want to buy or they want to rent. Is that possible under the new PRP? Yes, um, if they, if most of the applicants first, if their uh, first choice would be to rent a property, um, because obviously that gives them uh, the time uh, to learn about the country, to go around the country, and eventually then they decide where they want to, to settle. Uh, so that is what normally happens. Um, they start with a, with a rent, with a property lease, and then eventually they can uh, they go for a property purchase. They can um, sort of shift from lease to purchase, they can also shift from one property to another. For example, first they lease in the south of Malta, then they decide to, to go to Gozo, or they decide to go to the central area. Uh, so yes, they are uh, free to, to do so. However, there cannot be a, a long um, time lag between obviously one property and another. Uh, they have to sort of have an address um, consistently um, throughout their stay here in Malta. All right, perfect, excellent. And then there's there's another questions that I get it I got um, I get it asked quite a few times and um, been asked by by a person that actually is not in the audience and by was asked by Peter Pretzko actually. Uh, if basically is the residence program if the PRP basically it is followed or would qualify for the main program or if there is anything that it can be. Um, basically moved towards, not the financial requirements, because the financial requirements, they are going to be different and the applicant will need to uh, fulfill those. Um, but for example, the time and the residence, uh, if there is something that, that it can be, you know, they're gonna start with a PRP and they move directly to the citizenship eligibility stage and the domain, or would they have to start the domain from, from the very beginning? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, up to now, uh, sort of, they need to start um, from scratch. Um, however, uh, it's more uh, of a question that would be better answered by by community Malta agency, um, because obviously we have separate uh, separate agency, um, and uh, sort of they handle the applications. Uh, separate from us um, so far but so far there is sort of no direct link between our residency program and, uh, and uh, citizenship um, so they eventually would need to um, reapply from scratch submit fresh documentation go through the due diligence process etc okay so but they will have to start with a residence application or they can jump directly to let's say that one year after being under the prp they want the expedited route uh, for the main regulations. Can they go there or would they have to start from scratch? So, so far, as far as I know, they have to start from a fresh. Excellent, not, not a problem. Then um, a couple of questions as well for, for you, Mr. from, from Mark, uh, from you, Charles. Um, they are basically if a main applicant applies and then the wife applies at the later stage. Can she, can the wife be included at the later stage? Yes, yes, she can. Perfect. Obviously, um, we need to conduct due diligence um, on her, uh, full due diligence, um, because obviously we conduct due diligence on every applicant, which is 18 plus. Uh, so um, it's subject to due diligence, basically. Yeah. There will be the fees, the regular forms, yes. so, yes. so, 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 yeah, that's typical stuff. And then there's another one. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, other regulations or programs in the uh, investment migration market, especially in the Caribbean, that um, they have been allowing. They, they don't have basically cooked down with the prices, but they have included horizontally um, the, the family members to be included in the application. This question goes that way. Uh, if there are any plans in the future to include siblings uh, within the, the PRP program? Um, if, the, if the siblings are included in the initial application, obviously it's part of the package, so they are free of charge. But eventually, if they want to include them at a later stage, 
um, there is a, a fee to it, but they can include include them. But the siblings of the main applicant? The children, or sorry, I, I misunderstood the question. Obviously, the children, I was referring to the children of, of, yeah, of, of the, the main, main applicant. applicant. Yes. So this is basically one main applicant and a brother and a sister of the main applicant. Uh, no, no. The uh, main applicant can include his spouse, his children, parents and grandparents, or in those, but not his and brothers future, and sister. And in the future, there are no plans of modifying that neither? No. Perfect. Excellent. Um, then, uh, Mark is also making a, a slight um, a clar the, the clarification, which is basically, Let's suppose that at the time of the, of the application, there is a single applicant which is married. Sorry, a single applicant which is single. Three years down the line, that applicant gets married. Can the new wife, or can, can the new um, dependent be included in the application? Yes. Perfect. That's that's clear. Excellent. Yeah, I answered the, the, the this the same way as you. Even even if, for example, um, there is a family who eventually sort of the initial application they have young children. Let's say they are fourteen years of age, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, five years later, their children um, get married. Those children can eventually include their their future spouse in the application as well. Perfect. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And then one last question here in the Q&A section is if the Malta residence program uh, would allow for citizenship after basically the seven years for, of physical residency in Malta. So it won't be, yeah. They would eventually need to apply with Community Malta Agency um, and obviously follow their, um, their legislation and, and the regulations. So they can eventually uh, apply, but there are specific time frames for that. Um, uh, this is something that is sort of held separately. Obviously, if they, um, they have been residing here in Malta for, for a long time, obviously it would be uh, beneficial, but this is the, those, these are two different pro, um, programs which are administered by separate agencies under different regulations and legislations. Yeah, this, this person is, is referring actually by ordinary or naturalization actually, not the residency or citizenship. Uh, as far as I know, they can only apply for naturalization after uh, the moment, after somewhere between 15 to 18 years. Um, so they need to have uh, a base, they need to be stay here in Malta for around 15 to 18 years in order to be able to apply. But it might be the legislation changes in the future, I don't know. So but, but at, at the moment in time, it's the time frame is around the region. Perfect, excellent. Now, I have, uh, before I go to, to Swiss Insurance Partners, I have one last question actually for, for you, Charles. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, basically, let's put it in this way, there's a lot of competition, different options like in Europe. I mean, you have from the Irish IAP program uh, to Portugal, to Greece, whatever have you. Um, basically, what is on your eyes as the CEO of the agency, which will be the most outstanding features that uh, an applicant will choose Malta over any other um, EU residence by investment regulations? Actually, it's a good question. Um, I believe, uh, obviously, the main selling feature for us is the country itself. Um, I am not saying that obviously Ireland is not nice or Portugal uh, is it nice, they're definitely uh, The weather not. is better in Malta than in, than in Ireland. <laughs> yes, but obviously uh, I believe that in, in general Malta has a, a lot to offer. Um, both sort of climate, health sector, education, um, the lifestyle, sort of the way of living, security. So. Um, Malta, despite its size, has a lot, a lot to offer. Um, uh, obviously, we still acknowledge that they are um, two strong jurisdictions. They are our, our, our competitors, um, but we believe that Malta, in itself, has has a lot to offer. And coupled to that, obviously, we are focusing a lot on uh, the service that we give to our agents and our applicants. 
Um, we strive to provide a good service and efficient service um, so that we, a lot of uh, our clients are, are happy and eventually, apart from bringing new customers, they recommend us to, to others as well. Brilliant. Excellent. Excellent point, actually. And, and I would like to add as well that uh, to that, that basically against the, the, the other programs, basically one of the main features of Malta is that the applicants, they make the, the application, they undergo through the due diligence, and then they make the investment if they want to make the investment. Uh, and that is, it is something that truth is our, our clients, actually. Um, it, it is a different, clients, when they look at Malta, it's like uh, Swiss insurance partners. When they look at Malta, when they look private healthcare, uh, they look at with a different angle, basically. We have clients, you no, know, there's, there's one for everything, but they look at Malta, they look at things basically with the ability to reside, with the ability to, uh, you know, a beautiful country, small but great country, with all the features that, that, that you mentioned, and with the peace of mind that they are going to be compiling an application that is very strong in compliance, uh, the Maltese regulations in terms of investment migration and others, and uh, that they are going to invest only if they have, at the end of the day, the, uh, the, the security of the visa that are prevalent in principle, while some jurisdictions, you know. In a nutshell, basically, we focus on um, quality and not quantity. So um, I think that is what we are after here. Indeed, indeed. And it's, it is just basically they start with, um, with a Rob and Kevin's uh, proposal, actually. It is the, 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 the quality of, uh, of the clients that we are after, uh, rather than the, the, the mass volume. And, and actually, uh, Rob and, and Kevin, I have a question here for, for you. I don't know if you are able to, to read it. It is uh, basically a very particular question. I don't know if you would like to um, read it. Uh, and answer it online. And I don't know if you would like basically to contact that that person uh, privately. Uh, myself? Uh, uh, no, no, for, for Rob and uh, for Swiss right. Insurance Partners, basically, from, from Manahit. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we just saw that uh, question. I think it's a, a very particular question that would need to be discussed also a bit confidentially. Um, what, what I can say is that even though it's, it's a very sad example, obviously, and, and we're always touched when we hear um, something like that, because that's cases that we deal with um, on the daily basis, and we know how difficult it is for a family to um, kind of cooperate in, in such a situation. It's also a good um, uh, example that is supporting basically what Robert previously said, um, that people think, you know, um, I can basically wait until something happens and I'll have enough time to figure out what to do once something happens. This is a very good case where, you know, insurance, getting insurance in such a situation will be extremely tricky, um, maybe even impossible because obviously of pre-existing conditions, um, getting private insurance might be an opportunity that is close for the rest of um, someone's life. But obviously, we would be happy to look into it a bit more in detail in a bilateral session. Brilliant. Not a problem. We'll, we'll discuss that uh, privately, not, not an issue. Then uh, I have a couple of questions that they were uh, sent basically before. Um, so basically, if you could give, we, we understand, and I particularly understand very, very well which it is your, your type of client, basically. But, uh, for the rest of the audience and the rest of um, fellow fellow practitioners that we have, uh, can you give us a, basically an idea of uh, basically who, who are your clients, where are they based, uh, how much do they travel? Because this is not your typical, you know, your box ticking exercise, you know, that you just basically to comply with something. You do it for that, but you also do it for the long term. And basically how you have been able to enable actually their, their health to, to be able to feel better and more secure? So the, the, uh, the simple answer is that there's no answer to that specifically because we have actually clients from 65 countries around the globe and not only one specific regions. We have everything from Latin America, Central Europe, Russia, UAE, GCC, um, Asia. And so um, it's it's a mix of uh, different clients that we have. Uh, some are just private uh, persons. Um, you know, some are wealthy. Some are just well-earning people who you know, want to take care of their health. And they need to you know, be around and they'll be mobile for some reasons. Um, we have 
Of course, we have very wealthy individuals who might have multiple residencies around the globe and they seek protection all around the globe. Um, we also work uh, with uh, companies. So, for example, we have some banks here in Switzerland that have their departments, which might be in Singapore or in Hong Kong. And they would they say, look, look, we have those 30 people that we send there on a rotating basis and we want them to have the best possible health protection in Singapore, for example. So we have group contracts for them um, to make sure that the whole group is protected and that everyone can get access to, to the uh, health protection. So it's a mix of people. It's hard to say we have, you know, everyone from Mr. No, Joe Schmo to, to billionaires in our database. So it's, it's it's a mix of everything and it's spread around the globe. So that's the, the easiest answer I can give. Well, that's, that's, that's great. And basically we like, I mean, I have, we have worked with, uh, with, one of, uh, with one of our clients in the past, but, and, and I know very well we, why, how, and where you, your services basically put, put value on the table. But um, if basically our audience can, can hear from, from you, basically, um, if you can tell us one example, basically, we, um, Swiss insurance partner was basically useful, helpful, has that value um, towards these clients, you know, that either from a preemptive perspective or perhaps, you know, in an emergency situation, uh, something like that. So, yeah, just one example I can give you is um, end of last year, we were contacted by um, one of our clients from the insurance business and she called us and said, look, my, my father, who was living in Slovakia, um, has just been diagnosed with uh, you know, cancer of the throat. He went to three different uh, hospitals, all very well hospitals. He got three different opinions. First one said, no, go cut it out, operate it. Second one said, okay, it's chemotherapy. And the third one said, it's radiotherapy or some combination of those two. And then what do you do? You know, if you get, go to three good hospitals, get three different opinions, what do you do? So basically, um, they, they called us, they sent us all um, the, the medical, medical records. We presented this to um, a, you know, as a panel of specialists for this specific type of cancer. And they said, look, it's very clear. This needs to be, this is nothing. Don't start cutting. You, he might lose his voice permanently. Um, this is something for radiotherapy. And so they said, okay, thank you for you know, giving us a clear answer and for answering it very uh, concisely. And then the next thing they said is, you know, can you help us maybe get to that doctor to, to for treatments uh, if, if possible? And so that was when still hospitals were still in half lockdown here in Switzerland. So it was not easy, but um, basically within one week, we managed to have the father from Slovakia in Switzerland already starting treatments. They, they were actually booked until March this year. So they wouldn't have started if they would have called themselves. Within, a week, within uh, one week, treatment was started. And um, no, he went through the uh, radiation therapy. And actually just last week, he got a text from his um, daughter that uh, cancer is gone. And basically wow. they're very happy that we gave them a second life. So it's that's the kind of stuff that's really nice to hear um, despite all the negative stuff that can happen. And um, that's why it's great to have a global network and to know who to talk to um, in such a situation and not lose time. All right, this is extremely rewarding. And actually it is, when you tie that, that experience, because that person was was from uh, from the Czech Republic, you mentioned, but if that person would have been basically from any other country that does not have access to the European Union, uh, it is extremely tricky because then you have to start thinking about how do I apply for a visa? How do I apply for anything? Uh, and you just basically, you may end up risking your life, not because you don't have the health insurance, but sometimes because you know you don't have the right access from one day to the other to go from, call it whatever, Nigeria, call it South Africa, call it, I don't know, Vietnam, Middle East, and coming over to, uh, to Europe. And that is one of the things that actually, um, it is coupled so well, basically, you know, private health insurance with uh, the Maltese uh, PRP, because it is a very strong, very stringent program focused on compliance, gives residency rights in, um, in Malta, and also that accessibility to more worldwide healthcare or European healthcare, basically. We, if that person would have been from whatever, Nigeria, as we were saying, it would have been much more complicated, I would guess. I know that you will have means to sort it out because we all do, but at the end of the day, if that person would need to go the next day, it is always very difficult. So, I mean, that is why I think that is such a good um, value proposition, you know, the Maltese residency, uh, the Maltese PRP with, um, or the main for, for the sake of citizenship or residence regulations with uh, Swiss insurance partners offering. So on that note, I don't know if you would like to, to make some end remarks. We don't have any more questions. So 
moving back to Charles. Charles, if you would like to make uh, some closing remarks from your end. And uh, thank you very much, basically, for, for being with us today. To conclude, I would like to thank you once again for giving us the opportunity to, be, to, to participate in this uh, webinar. It was a pleasure for us to be here and to uh, share our thoughts uh, and give us the opportunity, basically, to uh, explain the program in, uh, in more detail. Um, the feedback so far has been very positive, uh, despite that the program is relatively new. Um, it's only been launched at the end of, of March. We are looking forward to, to receiving more applications uh, from ourselves and obviously the, all the other agents. And we hope that um, we can provide a uh, very good service uh, to you and, and your clients. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, Robert, Kevin, any closing remarks that you would like to, um, to finish? Thanks very much again for being with us and for making that, that excellent presentation. Yeah, maybe just uh, one last word to also support uh, Charles. So we've been working with investment migration programs all around the globe for more than two decades now and are very closely tied to also those kind of clients. And uh, um, I have to say, uh, we've been working very intensely with Malta and from uh, with people from the Malta residency program. And we have uh, heard nothing but good things um, also compared to other res residency programs. So I can uh, only support uh, what you're doing and, and wish you also best of success. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We conclude uh, for now. A little bit five minutes over the over the time, but it was worth it. The, thanks to the to the question. So thanks to the audience and thanks to you, the speakers, for making this happen. Thank you, and we'll stay tuned for next time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye, Bye. everyone.